88, of course, was the bicentenary year. And we rode out from the Woolloomooloo side of Mr. McCrory's Point, and there's this sea of faces. And I put my arms up and I go, look, there's nobody here. There's nobody here. I claim this vacant land in the name of the King of England. I'm a barrister doing only criminal law, um, working in chambers in Martin Place in Sydney. And in 1983, I joined the ALS after having been in private practice as a solicitor since the 16th of July, 1979. Essentially, came in to fill a vacancy in their Grafton office. And so after about four weeks in head office, just to learn the system and get things organized, I, um, I, I went up to Grafton, took a new car with me, and um, I christened it the Bug Splatter Beast because that was what it wore a lot of. And, um, and, in, and so I know the mileage on that car. In the first 12 months in that car, um, I did 86,000 kilometres. It was a little office in Grafton, but a huge area. Uh, did all the court work from Tweed Heads on the border to Bellingen, south of Coffs Harbour, and as far west as Tenterfield, Dorigo and Bellingen. And, um, and that included, of course, Grafton, which had the jail, which is where the office was. It included Lismore, which was its own huge source of work. Casino had a very significant Aboriginal population. I had uh, a field officer, Avery, Avery Brown, a man who I have very, very strong affection for even today. I haven't seen him for years. And the office manager was Herbie Durow. And... Um, and there was, there was a secretary, or there were a couple of secretaries in the office in the time that I was there. And um, Avery Brown um, was a well-known footballer in the local um, Koori football team. And a very strong man, a very good man to have standing by you if ever there was a problem nearby. There was never a problem with Avery Brown standing beside you. He was a lovely bloke. It was a great life doing that work, although the work was huge. The miles were enormous. I had my library and I had a reasonable, because I was now in my fourth year of practice, but I'd, I'd, I'd all, all collected by now a reasonable library, uh, plus the office library, and I had it on the back seat of the Commodore under a blanket. And I had a dictaphone in the car, and, and I would we'd pull into the office at 6 o'clock, 6.15, 6.30 in the morning. I'd pick up, I'd drop off the files from the previous day with the tape, sign the letters from the previous day's typing, and uh, all from the typing from the day before, and, um, and then pick up the files which the secretary would have ready for me and a new clean tape, and, 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 and we'd head off and we'd drive to Mawillamba, Lismore, just Coffs Harbour, you know, I mean, you wouldn't do opposite ends of the patch in the same day, but you would uh, generally, it would be organised that you would have a, a series of courts to go to, uh, or almost always two courts in a day, sometimes three. So there were some times when I was out at communities and I'd finish work and I'd be talking to someone who would be a leader of the community. And it, it happened several times that um, I remember one time at uh, Mully Mully Crescent in Woodenbong, the mission up there in Woodenbong, um, an old chap I was talking to, he was the oldest man in the community, said, now then, I would just like to tell you about what life was like for Aboriginal people before white men came, and he was in his 80s. And, and quietly, the room filled up with people from the community. His house, his lounge room just filled up and people just quietly wandered in and sat down on the floor around. And essentially the old chap was talking to me, 
but he was telling stuff of such cultural significance that everybody wanted to know. And it was beautiful to listen. So you had those wonderful times when your work just came together in the courtroom and you could be completely effective because you knew the community, you knew the people, you know, um, and, and so often courts would cut you a lot of slack. They would agree that, you know, you'd, you'd just ring up and say, uh, I've got one cases one, two, three, and four, or you just give the names, and I'll be there at 11.30, and I'll be there at two o'clock, I'll be there at whatever, and so they would hold your files for you. And so you'd go and do this, and then move on to there. And it, it worked very well, and, and magistrates and, and um, judges were often very, very supportive. Anyway, after 18 months, or nearly 18 months or something up there, um, the Bayugal asbestos cases were looming with the end of the of the parliamentary inquiry into the Aboriginal, Aboriginal workers at the asbestos mine at Bayugal. And, um, and because I was the only one in the ALS staff at that time who had uh, civil practice experience, Bayugal uh, cases then sort of took over and dominated my life for the next couple of years. Um, and during that time, I met um, some significant people, some people who turned out to be of some great significance. I met Mum Shirl. Mum Shirl was charming but blunt. And she was stunning as a witness. She had such courage. She had, she had such a reputation amongst judges that it was incredible to produce her in the witness box for the effect that she would have in the courtroom. So um, I became principal solicitor in probably January um, 87. And I remained principal solicitor 87, 88, and up to April 89. 88, of course, was the bicentenary year. And they were times when we were watching uh, a massive change unfold in Australia. The Aboriginal Legal Service, in fact, ran a challenge to the Bicentennial Authority Act. An Aboriginal printer, Lou Davies, um, applied for a licence to print a T-shirt with 200 years of genocide. Justice Brennan in that Davis against the Commonwealth and the Bicentennial Authority Act case said these words in his judgment. He said, it is of the essence of a free and mature nation that minorities are entitled to freedom of expression. Minorities are accordingly entitled to freedom in the peaceful expression of dissident views. And with the day of the bicentenary approaching, that, um, that year of 1987 into early 88 was, was the busiest year of my life up to that time because um, a huge amount of organisation went into preparations for that um, because of the importance of Aboriginal people and their right of protest. So what we did was we, on the, on the morning of the day before, that's the morning of the 25th of January, we drove my box trailer down, down to Mrs Macquarie's Point and chained it up and, and had the boat sitting upside down in it and chained it all in place and left it there. And then um, in the late morning of the 26th of January, and by this time, of course, there's somewhere between a million and two million people on Sydney Harbour foreshores. And there are thousands of Aboriginal people, um, particularly on Mrs Macquarie's Point. And you can't see the ground. There's thousands and thousands of people there. And we picked my, unchained my boat off the trailer and picked it up and carried it over, over our heads and just said to the crowd, we're coming through. And we walked down, carried the boat down through the crowd, down to the foreshore, and 
one guy had a bag with the clothes from ABC props and um, so I had a Captain Philip nautical captain's hat and a coat and um, and I was rowed and, and, and we had one fellow dressed as a, as a junior officer and one fellow was dressed as an ordinary sailor and he and he rowed the boat and I sat on the on the seat in the rear, it's only a small dinghy, but you know, three, it carried three people adequately. And we rowed out from the Woolamaloo side of Mrs. Macquarie's Point out to the front of Mrs. Macquarie's Point, and then I stood up and, 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 and there's this sea of faces, and I put my arms up and I go, look, there's nobody here, there's nobody here. I claim this vacant land in the name of the King of England. Well, Half a dozen curries jumped in the water and swam out. And one of them, who was really swimming really hard, really aggressively, and with a huge amount of force, led the others. And, and as you got close, I leaned over and I said, remember, mate, it's all in fun. And he goes, yeah, it's all in fun. And pushed the side of the dinghy over, over into the water, dinghy upside down, lost my hat. And it was a great day. Yeah, I, the ALS was right in the middle of all of that. I had a, of course, because, <clears throat> because of my position on that day, I, all, I had a radio telephone to police headquarters. And apart from my unannounced and short term bit of theatre with the boat, the rest of the day I was from time to time chatting on the radio about what was happening in Sydney at the, at the moment and what things were a concern. It was a great day that day.